Hello and welcome to yet another conversation on CNBC Africa. Of course, being first in business worldwide, we have to capture the news as it happens. Now, as of today, we saw a conversation on uh, cost-free payment services being launched here in Rwanda. It seems a bit exciting, but we need to get to the modalities of it. Norwegian company Blockbonds, of course, has their spin up. We have the CEO here. They partnered with the INDM Bank Rwanda Limited uh, to provide a solution that should see transfer, transaction uh, of cash at no cost. The solution to it, blockchain. Without giving too much away, let me just introduce uh, my panelists uh, and then we'll get uh, deep into the heart of the conversation. Uh, to the extreme left, we have the CEO of INDM Bank Rwanda Limited, Robin Bairstow. Right next to him, we have uh, Hans uh, Glasso, CEO of uh, Block Bonds and Spen. You're the ones that bring the disruption to the market. And of course, uh, we have, uh, to just give, give us perspective, even across the border, we have uh, Norbe Haguma, uh, who heads uh, the blockchain hub at uh, Smart Africa. So let's jump straight into it. Um, Robin, I have this one now is very personal between you and I because we spoke twice about your expectations and the, uh, the revenue generation or what you were doing in terms of streamlining at INDM and at no point did you mention that you had a blockchain solution in the horizon. So guide us through the genesis of this conversation. The, it was unfortunately, George, I know that we have a good relationship but we wanted to keep it under wraps. Uh, we've been d just finished doing one month of uh, user ac acceptance testing. We had it a very small scale. It was basically family and friends and some uh, users within the, the market. Team from uh, Spen have been going out recruiting um, uh, store owners, beauty salons, restaurants, etc. And then we've been testing it with a, with a very small user group. And then we've got 500, we had 500 uh, companies that were signed up, small companies and then uh, about another 500 users that have been using it in between each other, putting money in, putting money out, paying for transaction services. So we had to unfortunately keep it under wraps. Uh, and I must say the people have kept the, the confidentiality quite good. So which brings me now to ends. Um, so we've uh, been trying to understand what is done within the pilot stage for most or, or trying to understand the market. Um, when you're trying to accommodate, uh, to uh, bring together data and trying to find out these cost scoring mechanisms and banking the unbanked, this is an area that needs years of conversation or years of on-ground study. How was that uh, tackling in with the INDM? I'm sure they had a lot of coming in, but your reflection from different markets and coming to the wonder market. Yeah, so first of all, we are uh, currently working in 11 countries. And uh, of course, the experience that we have from the other markets is very important when also here in Africa. Uh, we have been uh, live tested in, in Kenya, and we have also done testing in India, and we have done testing in, and currently are uh, in a pre-launch in, in Philippines as well. And of course, the, the, the level of data that we're getting there is extremely valuable when it comes to Rwanda. And this pre-period here with, with INM Bank here is also very valuable. Uh, so, but still the, um, the acceptance is, is, is very high and we see that a lot of people is adopting the product. They are very enthusiastic of, of what we are doing, uh, which is in line with, with all the other markets uh, where we currently are present. And, and, and uh, we, we will co continue to work uh, looking into new markets and, and to roll it out in, in further markets. Right. Uh, the concept of banking the unbanked, we seem to have a bit of a problem with that, uh, mainly because some of those who are unbanked or underbanked do not own a smartphone. But the application of uh, Spend, the app itself, is dominantly on a smartphone. So guide us through that. That's correct, and uh, but uh, if I can put a little bit wider, bit for, for, for example, in India, how they jumped over the landline telephones and jumped straight into the mobile phones, this is exactly how we see it in other markets as well. Um, if I can take a little bit longer approach to that, I, I started to look into this and I was seeing the issue from being an unbanked or underbanked person, how can he uh, communicate with me and you financially? It was not possible for some years ago, and this is what we have solved. We have created a system where we have an autonomous interaction between an unbanked or underbanked and a bank person. That's what we have done. And uh, then we, we, we were looking into um, uh, the issue itself. I mean, there is more than two billion people in this, on this planet that doesn't have a bank account. And by giving them the opportunity to take part of the same as me and you, 
it's a life changer for them, right? And, and they're now capable of, of uh, taking part of things that we can take part of. And only because they do have a smartphone, and I'm going to come back to that, they can now uh, take part of the same services as me and you can. Okay, so when it comes to, for example, Philippines, to talk about that first, it's a, it's a country of 103 million people, uh, but there is only 4 million bank accounts, but there is 45 million smartphones, so that's quite a big market. I can break these numbers down for you also in Kenya and here as well. This is exactly the same here. Um, so within the Smart Africa, of course, Rwanda is in charge of smart cities and this does not exclude financial transactions. How do you read into such a partnership, breaking into the Rwandan market, given the conversations that have been happening from a government to a public level? I think it's a great development actually for, um, not only for Rwanda, but for Africa to have a project like this one, mm. which combines the blockchain technology with existing banks and uh, is offering a service that is better than the mobile money that we have right now mm. or the bank transfers. Uh, I think uh, in the end of the day, it's about the economy and whatever solution allows the economy to be more efficient mm. is the one that will win out. So you can think of uh, the mobile money transfer fees as a sort of a tax or a, a non-tariff barrier. Um, and that this, what they're doing is that they're breaking down those barriers. Mm. So I think it could be very, very important Right. for Africa. But um, what I'm most happy about is uh, for this blockchain technology is to have provable use cases, right. you know, things that are working, things that are being done. So I really encourage the, the, the cooperation to continue. I think they're just starting. I think they have only scratched the surface. And uh, I think that um, really um, just the transfers is not even the biggest problem there is. Remittance is really not the biggest problem there is. Mm. Because if you look at it from a CFTA angle that you need to create uh, a Pan-African uh, single digital market, then you need much more than just ability to send money cheaply. Right. You need the ability to prove who you are, you need the systems and the platforms that allow people to trust each other even if they don't know each other. That's what really is going to bring a serious impact on, on Africa. So I, I applaud this uh, early um, uh, stage, mm -hmm. I think, um, and I look forward to what they're going to come up with next. Right. You were at the Blockchain Summit in Uganda. There's another Blockchain Summit happening in New York as we speak. So it's clear that the, the idea is here and every nation is trying to catch up. But in regards to the conversations that we have either with a centralized and a decentralized system, the conversation with governments is very centralized. They need to understand what exactly is happening nation by nation. Just give us what your experiences have been in the border, within Rwanda and outside. Well, the, first, there's so many companies which are experimenting with the blockchain. It was more than I expected. I was especially surprised uh, in, in uh, Uganda. They have some really great initiatives going on. In Rwanda too, uh, similar to what uh, INM is doing, they're keeping it uh, a bit secret for now, but I think they'll be coming out soon. And um, the, the, there seems to be a, a growing acceptance of what blockchain technology can bring to Africa. Uh, basically, it's the internet of value. So we have now the internet of information. And the problem that blockchain solves is that when I send you a me message or an email, it's I copy this information from me and I copy it to you, and it's copied a thousand times along the way. But if I want to send you money, if I want to send you a land title, I cannot do the same thing. I cannot have a double spend, because if I send you 5,000, it has to move from me to you. And in a way that everybody accepts that there is no possibility of me keeping that 5,000. Right. So that's what technology, the, the, that's what the blockchain technology right. is solving for us. But it's, um, what, what is uh, going to happen in, in these next few months, I think is uh, more cooperation amongst African countries. I think there's a lot of uh, duplication of effort. Something that we're doing in Rwanda is being done in Kenya. Another thing is being done in, uh, in Benin. We're all learning from scratch. So we're looking into things like uh, blockchain hackathons. Mm -hmm open source project to kind of bring the community of very, very passionate developers together with economists and policy makers and to have more cases that prove that the technology is viable. Fantastic. Robin, which brings me now to that. Now we've, we've had the context being created so we can dive deep into the details. Um, you know I'm a fan when you speak about numbers, uh, particularly because we need everyone to understand. Um, the business case made for this, no transaction to you, uh, to the public, no transaction to the consumer, to, that has been painted within uh, marketing of this particular project. 
But where is the backing, the financial backing, and where, what is the business case for INDEM? From a technology point of view, number one, we saw this as an opportunity not to be left behind. We know that there's direct disruption that's, that's coming in the market, and we'd rather, we thought we'd rather grab it with both hands than try and uh, uh, keep it under, under wraps, because I, I think this is the future. The, the essence of banking, what I've based my entire life on and career on, has been creating an element of trust and creating trusted parties where, if you don't know one another. So we've always been an intermediary, and for that we have invested in technology, and we have the, the reputation of being the trusted middle part. What we have now in this technology is you, you, you're leaving the middleman out completely. There's no trusted middle, middle, middle man. Think about remittances, and Jens and I were k kicking some numbers around. Um, nearly half, nearly um, 500 billion dollars a year is sent in, rem in remittances a annually to developing countries from the diasporas. Um, consider that 7.5% is the average cost of a remittance uh, coming from abroad. Um, the amount of money that is wasted that's four times more than development money, development money going to those, those countries. It's, imagine the money that's wasted. That's $37.5 billion every year that we're spending on sending money around. If we can put that money back in the people's pockets by creating a, a system where you don't need a middleman, where you're taking a trust, a trust partner out of it. And let me take it down even to the even more practical example. Even when I give you 5,000 francs, you know me, I know you, maybe you don't know me, but you trust in that money. Why do you trust in the money? Because the central bank has regulated that that is legal tender. So there's still a middleman in, involved in that, even though it's a, even though it's a cash, cash transaction, because that's been classified as, as legal tender. What we have over here is there's no middleman. So I'm quite happy to pay, spend a fee for them to be able to bring me in, uh, in accounts. Once more, back, back to the numbers. Because maybe you could just uh, detail it for us. What's the cost of acquisition of a customer as vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the cost of agency banking at INDM? So um, this, in terms of acquisition of customers, you're running anywhere between 20 and $60 per customer, depending on where you're operating. Um, your cost, th there's no cost. I don't have any staff that are involved in this. Jens has no staff dedicated to this either. You know, one of the things that we have as bankers, we, we love to, you know, have uh, the blocks that you have to fill in, etc. make your life uh, tough yeah. in terms of uh, understanding. There's, there's been times when I've had to call my staff to say, can you explain this to me? And I'm filling in one of my, my own forms. Yeah, yeah we load it st it's straight onto, the, onto spend. It's, a, it's available, it's digital, it's immediate. All right. Uh, Hans, now, which brings me now to you. I'd like to ask the same question about the business case because, I mean, it's not entirely from your part. You have your partner um, outside. We'd like to know also about the distribution ledger, maybe where it's domiciled, uh, what kind of uh, modalities you're working with, with collection of data. And then just guide us through, in the event that you need to increase the solutions that are being offered, is that a cost to you, cost to company, cost to consumer, long term? Okay, so so there is a couple of ways, of course, to to um, to get the customers to adopt the product, and um, one thing is that uh, that they can download the app, and in a minute they uh, they have suddenly changed their um, their own personal situation from being unbanked to be banked. When we're talking about this group of people. But of course, it takes the same time for the others. But the point is now we are touching upon their self-esteem and dignity. And I think this is quite important to remember because not only here, but in many other countries also, we're actually affecting people's life. Okay? So now they download this app and now they have changed this and they will tell about this to the other people around them because it actually brings some positive value to their life. However, we still need to do marketing to make sure that we grasp the market as efficient as possible because if we don't grow fast enough, it will also be difficult for us to actually get the distribution that we want. I and them being a regional bank, uh, how digitizing the Ronan Frank could work across the border, but we'll come straight into to that. Uh, no, but we just had a conversation the other time at Transform Africa where um, the vice governor of the central bank mentioned to the pa other panelists that they needed 
um, practical solutions that have worked in different countries, right, to get that going. So when you hear such a partnership, we'd like to know from uh, the Smart Africa or the Blockchain Hub perspective where the red flags are, where the opportunities are trying to work out such a, uh, such a system for the Wandan people. Mm. Okay, so it's a great deal we're looking at uh, INM perspective. I think they're getting a great uh, partner who's going to give them technology and help them acquire customers. And it's really good for Rwanda because uh, the, the country is uh, trying to achieve a cashless economy, right. but that, uh, that vision is restricted by the tax I, to I talked about earlier, right. which is the transfer if you're going from MTN to Tigo or somewhere else. So it's a very p positive development uh, for, for the country. But um, I think uh, going, uh, going ahead, there's going to be a need uh, for a, a sort of a, uh, interoper interoperability mm -hmm. in between the systems. So what is developed in Rwanda should be able to talk with the system that exists in Ghana. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is really the, the real promise of blockchain uh, because we want uh, a single digital African market. Mm -hmm. That means if you see something on a website in Ghana that you like, you should be able to just pay for it instantly. Right. Yeah. In, in that regard, now in regards to federated information systems, because that is sovereign, right? In, in regards to data, but now here we see a solution that could easily be adopted or replicated, which uh, I'm sure Hans also wants to speak a bit more on. How do we work around the conversation on federated information systems? Well, that's a bit tricky. I think uh, people are still trying to figure it out. I think the existing business model for companies like Facebook and Google which is basically to accumulate consumer data and yeah. sell that data to get more money. So it, they call it free, but it's not really free. Right. I think that uh, these are going to be the victims of this new blockchain technology. Right. And I think that uh, any um, technology, whether it's uh, existing uh, like uh, SPEN and INM, that doesn't think about that is also going to meet some trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, uh, as uh, especially in Africa, as uh, people integrate and start communicating with each other, and they're going to have um, uh, more need for privacy, more need to control their own identity. So the more central control there is in the system, no matter at what level, mm -hmm. is going to be problematic. Mm -hmm. So I think that the companies that will succeed in this uh, uh, new economy, if I should call it, are the ones that are going to be uh, giving services on top of what I think is going to be a blockchain protocol. Right, perfect. So, yeah. When we were touching base on um, the kind of conversation we were to have, Robin, you missed out on this question, and I'll just ask it again to Hans. Um, we have the other banks in Rwanda, and uh, I asked you this uh, question before. Would you have, or would the partnership have more success if you try to incorporate the other banks in Rwanda, or try to incorporate the banks that INDM already has uh, and now change just the currency uh, within the region. So I'm sure you have your uh, perspective on this, but Hans, please, just guide us through that. Yeah, okay, so, so we partner up with, with one bank and uh, what you were saying is that this is a uh, layer on top of the bank. So what we have created is the digital banking and put that as a layer on top of the bank. And uh, this is a system which, which uh, works uh, fine or perfectly well nationally or internationally, it doesn't really matter. And it speaks with, with whoever has a smartphone and don't know to expand. When it comes to other banks and, and if it will be beneficial for us to have more than one bank, no, absolutely not. Because well, we, since there is no walls, it's about the people. It's about what the people hold in their hands. And it's about having this phone in your hand. And when you have this, you have a bank account. So now the banks is just the layer who's keeping control of the cash. And the banking goes back to what the bank is supposed to be. It's handling and lending and mortgages and, and doing what a bank should do. And this is exactly what we are providing. Of course, we can work with more than one bank but it wouldn't make any difference for us. So we are more than happy with the partnership that we're having at this stage. Right. Of course, uh, now there was the uh, question as well about whether someone uh, with a SPEN app actually has a, a mobile, uh, uh, an account number uh, at INDM, which brings about the point, if I'd like an advance, a facility from uh, INDM, if you're saying that this is an actual solution that could help you know, with financial inclusion, I would need to have this as among the things that I could bring to you if you were to give me a loan for a mortgage, for example. 
Well, I think it goes back to what Norbert said uh, earlier on um, when he's saying this remittances, payments, etc., is only we're only scratching on the surface. The other one is recording the data for his, to use his analogy, the farmer up country that's made his, uh, done his produce, he's paid his money in, he buys and sells, he's uh, using the, the money that he's raised to, uh, to, to spend, etc. He's made sales and he doesn't have a record of that because it's all been done cash. Now he's got an application where we as banks, what is the, the most difficult the most difficult issue for, for us as banks working in developed market, developing markets is um, financial data on the, on the, on the applicants. Right. This gives us a, a platform where we can re get recorded data because it records everything. Because you can see cash in, cash out, where purchases have been made, who money is getting transferred, for, transferred to. So he's got a bank statement. It's not costing him anything to get that bank statement because it's there and I can extract it and the, the applicant can extract it. So certainly our next one, once we've built up the database, the next, uh, the next logical step in this is to use that as an ability to raise, um, to raise small scale loans or loans to look at the, the users that we've attracted so far. It's not the large supermarkets, the chains, etc. We've gone to the small users, the small salons, restaurants, um, clothing stores, shoe shops, etc. That's who we've attracted. Now they, we've already started to get data on them, and that's the, the the next level. That's true financial inclusion, not just the payments and remittances. Just one last point, and I'll start uh, with Norbert. Um, what do you think such a partnership or such a project could evolve into, and where is Smart Africa's role in trying to make this work? Um, so you have to look at uh, the entire economy to understand how important this is. When you look at uh, in terms of uh, uh, value chains, so distribution of value chain, um, when uh, the example I, I talked earlier with uh, Robin, you have a cow farmer in the eastern province who produces 10 liters of milk per day. He sells that milk every day. It's all written down on paper and he, can, he cannot bring this paper to INM Bank and get credit mm. because INM Bank will look at the paper and say, well, you could have forged this. There's no proof. There's no, no, our people were not there when these transactions were happening. Right. But when you add the blockchain, which, is, which has the most important aspect is immutability, mm. then this record will not change. If I, bought, if, if I sold 10 liters last month, it's not going to magically change to 9 liters. Right. It's always going to be 10, li 10 liters. So then the, this farmer will basically have proof of the transaction that he's been doing. So he'll be able to, get, to access credit from INM Bank. But on top of that, if this farmer now is dealing with the milk distribution center, which is also maybe a client of INM Bank, and the settlement in between them, which maybe takes 30 days, 60 days at this point, could be automated so that it happens immediately. How exciting is your trajectory now? Rwanda uh, being the first that you've gone fully live, and then of course there will be expectations from your end, but you still have to handle the phases here in the country. Guide us through what your uh, mid uh, and near term looks like. I think what we have, at least what we know, is that we have a tool that can bring this more efficiently to the market, although not everyone has a smartphone yet. But we believe that innovation, you can't stop innovation. It, it, it will continue. Okay. And I think therefore, yes, there will come other companies. We maybe have to align with other companies, but the point is that people will constantly improve. And even if the farmer sees that this is an important tool for him because now we can keep track of his funds, I can easily send the money to the bank or to any other person without physically moving there. Mm -hmm. I think this is brilliant. Um, what we saw some years ago, um, uh, we also saw in, in Norway, uh, we have a, a system uh, there which is called VIPS and, and it was uh, one of the biggest banks in Norway who was launching this product and honestly we were living in a world where we had all the features. I had the cards, I have internet banks, I, you know, you have everything and suddenly there came a tool which you could send money very easily on, on, on phone to another person and it took the whole market immediately the first year it was like more than two million customers the first year out of two and a half possible you know Norway is a small country mm -hmm. but this is just showing that simplicity is important. What does the future or near to meet them look like at least in regards to some of these uh, uh, digital interventions? I think we we aiming to uh, Jens and I have put a little side bet 
that we doubled our customers uh -huh. uh, over the next three months. Uh, so existing customers, we will have double the amount of customers on uh, on the spend platform right. within three What's months. What's the exact number for but, existing uh, customers? We'll should be at about, uh, we have 60,000 customers at the moment. We're banking on 120 extra customers. That puts it at 180,000 gotcha. customers in the, within the next uh, three months. It's almost like, uh, if you recall, I recall doing funding in the mo in the in the telecom sector back in the in the late 90s, early 2000s, and uh, one of the rollout uh, provisos in some of the the um, licenses that were given was that you had to roll out um, public telephones. Uh, together as part of your contribution. Mm. Um, when was the last time you saw a public telephone? I mean, yeah. th nobody knew at that stage how that technology you mo yes. spoke about, the leapfrog, that we leapfrogged uh, landline communication and we went straight to mobile phone. Yeah. Um, this, I think this is a leapfrog. This is a, an opportunity for us to leapfrog standard banking and move into the, into the future. I don't believe that uh, project finance and trade facility uh, and trade finance will change uh, in the near term. Right. But the way we are banking and sending money to one another, transferring money up country, spending money in small stores, even large stores, there's nothing stopping the, the bigger markets. That's the area we're going to make a difference. Um, in terms of us being able to open accounts, uh, one account a minute, I haven't seen that. Um, we've, we, we're very competitive and we've looked at some other launches of uh, digital products. Uh, no one has had a sign up that quick. Let's see if we can maintain it. I think we, we had to change the uh, change the banking um, within this part of the world. Right. You mentioned the right word, maintaining. Maintaining that, that one is the bit, the momentum at least. We hope to see it even after uh, today, which is the, the main day. So I really do appreciate you coming, gentlemen, and for your insight. Uh, Robin Bersto, CEO of i &M Bank Rwanda Limited, uh, Hans uh, Glasso, CEO of Block Bonds and Spen. Thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the weather. And of course, Nobel Haguma, uh, head of the blockchain hub at uh, Smart Africa. Thank you very much. We've been discussing this new solution. Of course, the underlying conversation is uh, if we'd like to uh, incorporate uh, this conversation on uh, financial inclusion as the liberty as we've been trying over the last couple of years then the solution might actually be uh, underlying in some of these new infrastructures new digital interventions that are coming and blockchain has been mentioned top on the list uh, so obviously uh, we'll keep track of the conversation and just uh, keep with us at CNBC Africa or at George Ndurango is my handle let's keep the conversation going but of course you heard it here first on CNBC Africa First in business worldwide.